uh, yeah, 2024. I'm so grateful for uh, all of you guys for braving the heat and uh, and being out here today. Um, I just came out uh, after this morning. I came out and told Michaela that you know people had been walking into the house and I was asking them confession or bathroom so that I could direct them to the correct line. And then I realized no one wants to be asked either of those questions. <laughs> like that's just, it's not okay. <laughs> so, so I left it to the rest of you to figure it out yourselves. You're welcome. <laughs> All right, so uh, it is my great, it's been my great pleasure to host this event at my home for the past 10 years. This is our ninth uh, conference. One year we missed one, I can't remember why. Um, I, I love the talks, I love the sacraments, I love the artisan fair, I love the food, I love that it makes internet friends into IRL friends, you guys know who you are. Um, I really love that it gives me a deadline for getting various home improvement projects finished and a reason to get the house and yard and various random outbuildings cleaned up. My, uh, my kids will tell you how much I love this. All right, where are my kids? There's one. All right. Um, did I prep you for this question? No. All right. What is my favorite week of the year? Uh, the week before Christmas. Oh, no. See, that's a good answer. The, but the correct answer is dumpster week. Dumpster week. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, la all last week, there was a giant red 40 yard dumpster in our driveway like the big construction one it's crazy how things accumulate right especially in trying times when you're in survival mode cleaning out the garage it's just probably not going to happen but this year my life while not uncomplicated is feeling stable for the first time in a long time so we got the big dumpster and john uh, and i et al filled that baby up together um, and I'll bet that you guys are interested in that, and we're going to talk about it, but in the context of some bigger concepts, too. So I'm going to call this talk Slavery and Surrender and Second Love. I know that some of you guys have been following our family saga for over 12 years now and praying for us for a lot of that time. So I think you've earned the right to feel a little bit nosy. I, I, think, that's, I think that's allowed, so yes. Uh, as Michaela said, I am married uh, to John Norton. Tomorrow will be uh, three months that we've been married and <laughs> eight months that we've been together. Uh, we're gonna talk about that today, about how it happened at all. I had a running joke with my friends over the past few years about how I was unmarriageable. Um, but as it turns out, all things are possible with God. Uh, shocking, right? All right, okay, so I'm going to talk about how I determined that I still had a vocation to marriage, or rather, uh, that I had another vocation to marriage, and how I used prayer and the sacraments, a radical trust in divine providence, and a not all that well known devotion called holy enslavement to discern that marriage to John was God's will for us and our children. That's right, holy enslavement. You're intrigued. And you're troubled. <laughs> I know. Stay with me. It's okay. All right. So first, uh, I know some of you are new faces. So we're going to start with a little recap of how we got here. And we're going to do a quick review of my talks here the past two years because this has turned into a trilogy of sorts. Um, the hinge, as it were, uh, is that in the summer of 2022, at the age of 46, I became a widow and the single mother of 10 children. Uh, let's start a little bit further back. I met my late husband, Jim, at an informational meeting for young adult volunteers at what had been my high school youth group. I was 23, he was 26. We got married a little less than a year after meeting, and we went out to dinner. When we went out to dinner for our first anniversary, uh, we brought a baby with us in February of 2007. Six and a half years after we were married, Jim was diagnosed with metastatic melanoma. I found out that I was expecting uh, baby number four two days later. Jim had medications and surgeries and radiation treatments. Baby Gus was born in November. 
The three of us visited the shrine of Our Lady of Lourdes in France that spring. After his course of treatments and our pilgrimage, Jim spent 10 years in remission. Uh, we had five more children in those 10 years. We were happy. Jim had a job that he cared about. I homeschooled and started Catholic all year. We bought our fixer-upper dream house and settled into life in a community that we really loved. In 2018, during a routine follow-up scan, it was discovered that Jim's cancer was back, or more likely that it had never really been gone. He started a new treatment plan. The melanoma tumors spread to his lungs and eventually his brain. Our youngest daughter, Barbara, was born in 2019. When she was two months old, Jim started having occasional grand mal seizures. Over the next two and a half years, Jim continued to be, as he always had been, a conscientious professional, a dedicated father, a devoted husband, a good friend, and a man of great personal faith. He died at our home on July 9th, 2022, at the age of 49. Surrounded by family and friends, having received last rites and viaticum, it was the kind of happy death that we Catholics pray to St. Joseph that we might get to have. My children and I had the consolation of strong support from our family and our community, material stability, and most importantly, each other. But I had to admit that my life was all of a sudden decidedly not what I would have wished it was. It wasn't what I imagined it would be. My husband was a good man. Our marriage felt easy despite the challenges that we faced. And then it was gone. We thought we would grow old together, but instead I was a single mother. Losing a husband is more than losing a person. It's also losing an imagined future and having to face decisions and hardships and circumstances that my marriage would have shielded me from. I was a person trying to figure out a new and different life, a life that did not look the way that I expected that it would. But I knew that it was still an authentically Catholic life. It was still my faith that was the animating principle of my existence. I knew, I, I know that while few people will have gone through exactly the same hardships that I faced, we all suffer, we all face times of crisis, and that means that we all face that decision point. Will this crisis bring me closer to God, or will it make me turn away from Him? As I began to reflect on it, as I began to talk with friends who had also experienced hardship and sorrow, three aspects of that process kept coming to mind of living through different stages of crisis and learning to cope with those ever-changing realities. I talked about two of those in my Fiat talk in 2022, my VSW or Very Sad Widow talk. That talk was about what had helped me cope as I lived for 16 years with the challenges and uncertainties of Jim's illness. Um, how I was inspired, one, to wait to worry. Uh, and. Uh, to, to recognize that even though I had this thing looming, looming over me, that on that particular day, I was okay, we were okay. And then number two, to rely on intercessory prayer in a deep way, especially when it was hard to pray for myself, that allowed me to keep from falling into despair. Those two strategies worked really well for me as I navigated the world as a person facing potential tragedy. It was really important for me not to live life trying to anticipate all the bad things that might happen. After all, we aren't given the graces to bear challenges that we haven't been given. The third coping strategy is a deep reliance on prayer and the sacraments, which I spoke about in my talk last year. But I'd like to add a related topic this year. This year, I'd like to add the concept of radical acceptance of God's will in one's life. As hard as it was at first to hear and recognize, losing my husband was God's will for me. Throughout Jim's illness, when people would ask how they could pray for me, I would ask them to pray that I would have radical acceptance of God's will for my life. That was my prayer for 16 years. Of course, the quiet part of that was that I hoped that the will of God that I would be radically accepting was aligned with what I wanted. Now, I do believe that those prayers were still effective. I believe that praying that way helped keep my heart open in a way that it might not have been otherwise. But even all those prayers didn't stop me from rebelling if somebody would attempt to comfort me by saying that 
Jim's death was God's will. In fact, here is, here's an example of the perils of Catholic influencing by living people such as myself. Um, I did a series of videos for Ascension Press about, uh, that were recorded about a year after Jim died. And in one of them, I talk about just this concept. I say that there is death in the world and suffering, but that all of that is just a side effect of the fall, that God hadn't wanted us to suffer, that wasn't the original plan, that God doesn't will our suffering, but he allows it because of free will and whatnot. And all of that is somewhat true, and it was comforting to me at the time. So if you're in the trenches, feel free to blame Adam and Eve. But eventually, uh, I came to see it differently. For my birthday last year, our fabulous MC and my fiat partner in crime and best friend Michaela gave me a tiny book with an intriguing title. It's called Trustful Surrender to Divine Providence, colon, The Secret of Peace and Happiness. You guys, reading this book made me so mad. <laughs> it did not have, who, has it, has, who's read this book? Anyone? Okay. Yes? Did it make you mad? <laughs> All right. Uh, it did not, upon my first reading, seem like it could possibly live up to the claims of its name. Certainly not the subtitle anyway. The first time through, it did not make me feel peace and happiness. It mostly made me feel triggered. <laughs> the authors are a 16th century priest and a 17th century saint, and they make a really compelling case based on scripture that everything that happens in our lives, good or bad, is specifically willed by God for our own good and will sanctify us if we will let it. In the case of the bad, we are to see uh, every circumstance from inclement weather to illness to persecutions to crimes committed against us as exactly what God wishes us to be experiencing in that moment. He does not will the sins committed by us or by others, but he does will the consequences of those actions in our lives in order that we would benefit from them in eternity. It was, as Christians before me have grumbled, a hard saying. But then I started thinking, my track coach at USC, did he will my suffering? He absolutely did will it. It wasn't some accidental byproduct. He willed my suffering and he orchestrated it. And it was specifically to get the best that I was capable out of me. I came to see the idea that my suffering could be the active will of God as certainly possible, not unreasonable, and really fitting to the perfections of God and supported by scripture. That vision of God that I thought that I had wanted, of him holding me in his arms and weeping with me because isn't life so unfair and darn that free will that caused the fall and introduced death and disease and decay into the world, and here was God just as powerless as I to stop it. That was what I thought I wanted, but with time, I came to see that it didn't fit at all with what I actually believe about God. I believe in a God of miracles. I believe in a God who intervenes in big human events and little private moments. I believe in a God who is all-powerful. I believe in a God who loves like a father and disciplines like a father. Am I to see myself as above St. Paul? who suffered imprisonments and beatings and multiple shipwrecks? Am I above Jesus, who tells Peter to put away his sword and not to try to prevent the suffering that is to come? That was just a philosophical piece, though. Even if I could resign myself to this new way of seeing, how could it be anything other than a hopeless drudgery in practice? But as I began to try to experience the circumstances of not just the loss of my husband, but all the little events of my day as willed by God and for my own good, I was shocked at how liberating it was. All of a sudden, everything felt different. The carefully sorted craft supplies that my four-year-old inexplicably decided to dump into one giant pile, the night on which three different children barfed all over three different rooms in my house. Uh, 
a person who had misled and mistreated me, grief and loss, last minute changes to my careful plans. I could experience it all not as chaos and failure, but as what God wanted for me in that moment. I think it might be the secret of peace and happiness after all. We have to remember that there must be a caveat attached to every prayer, spoken or unspoken, and that is, Lord, if it is your will, dot, dot, dot. Anytime we ask God for something that we think we want, we, we have to remember that we only want it if God wants it. We must remember that God is not bound by our prayers. The goal of prayer isn't to change God. The goal of prayer is to change us. And for me, it really did. The challenges that I faced as a widow and a single mother were the most difficult of my life. I really had nowhere to turn but to God. I threw myself into prayer. I had always meant to say a daily rosary. I had always recommended it. <laughs> but it was widowhood and heartbreak that made me actually commit myself to it. I became a daily mass goer again after years of that not having been possible. I started making daily visits to the Blessed Sacrament, not to sit in quiet, peaceful reflection. No, to tell God, I don't like this, fix it. <laughs> Um, all right, don't worry guys, the meet cute is coming, romance is on the way, but first we're going to talk about the final piece of the spiritual outlook that I believe prepared me to be open to God's will and able to do my best to discern it when it came. And you guys know that I like the weird Catholic stuff, well get ready to be a little bit uncomfortable because now we're going to talk about holy enslavement. All right, the roots in this devotion in me were planted a long time ago at the very beginning of our liturgical living in the home journey and in fact through our family's liturgical living in the home uh, our, our very favorite liturgical living in the home tradition and i'll bet you guys wouldn't be able to guess what it is because of all the crazy practices that we do throughout the year like the devil pinata that we hit with swords for michaelmas last weekend and eating spaghetti with our hands on the Feast of St. Joseph, and making boeuf gras Sundays out of all the treats in the house for Fat Tuesday. Even in the face of all of that, my kids will pretty consistently tell you that their favorite tradition of the year is the novena that we do over the, nine, the last nine days before Christmas. <clears throat> so it uses prayers and call and response from the Liturgy of the Hours plus readings from the Old and New Testament that trace salvation history and are fulfilled in one another. Except, it seemed, for the readings of December 19th. Imagine, if you will, couches and various overflow seating filled with innocent tyranny youngsters and invited friends and neighborhood guests. And for many years on that date, someone would be tasked with reading the following from the book of Deuteronomy. When you release a male from your service, as a free person, you shall not send him away empty-handed, but shall weigh him down with gifts from your flock and threshing floor and wine press. As the Lord your God has blessed you, so you shall give to him. For remember that you too were slaves in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I'm giving you this command today. But if he says to you, I do not wish to leave you, because he loves you and your household, since he is well off with you, you shall take an awl and put it through his ear into the door, and he shall be your slave forever. Your female slave also you shall treat in the same way. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> the kids would be like, Mommy, what's an awl? <laughs> um, all right. So the Novena was originally compiled by an Italian priest in 1721, but I found it around 2008 on a website that was sharing the content of a 1982 book that was in turn quoting from a 1955 book. So somewhere in that game of telephone, one of the readings was misnumbered. <clears throat> and as I was editing the Catholic All Year Prayer Companion, because I wanted to include it in that, and I was noting how well all the daily readings went together, all except that one, it occurred to me that, hey, hey there might be a mistake. And I discovered that while Deuteronomy 15, 13 through 20 made everyone uncomfortable, 
Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 25 contains the Old Testament quote that is referenced in the New Testament reading for that day. So I went ahead and switched it. <laughs> Uh, but obviously that other reading stayed with me and all of us forever, I assume. Uh, later, I came across this concept of voluntary slavery or holy enslavement again in the writings of St. Louis de Montfort, which Father was speaking about this morning in Mass. Uh, it wasn't until I was living as a widow and a single mother that the devotion really made sense to me. The slavery to which the Old Testament reading is referring is obviously different from the race-based chattel slavery of the Americans, which with, with which we are all unfortunately familiar. In other versions, it's translated as bondsmen, which is probably more accurate. These slaves in the ancient world would be sold to someone for a period of time, sold either by themselves or their families, as, or as spoils of war. They would then regain their freedom at the end of an appointed time. So what would have induced a person who had earned her freedom to choose to get an all through the ear and stay enslaved? It could only be that she had become part of the household or even part of the family, that she was cared for and treated with respect, and that she trusted the judgment and leadership of her owner, that she would rather live under the authority but also the protection of a master. Thousands of years later, amidst the political and religious upheaval of 17th century France, St. Louis de Montfort asked his followers to acknowledge that they were slaves of the love of Jesus Christ through Mary, and even suggested that they wear small chains as an external sign of this condition. Of course, all of the conditions of a perfect enslavement would, of course, be fulfilled by our Lord and his mother Mary. As I mentioned earlier, as a widow, I was in an enviable position in many ways. I had the consolation of the happy death of my husband. I had the support of my community and extended family. I had financial security. I, had, ha I have a wonderful children with whom to weather the storm. But I also had so much responsibility. I was on the hook for all of it, the care of the children and our home, parenting and school and financial decisions, decisions in my personal life, and no one really who could be that sounding board. And that day to day was what I found the most difficult. I kept thinking back to that bondswoman in Deuteronomy and how much I'd love to get a quick all through the ear and be able to just <laughs> abdicate all this responsibility. Uh, because that was not going to be possible in a literal sense, I really felt drawn to that devotion of holy enslavement. I could in prayer say to God, I don't know what I'm doing and you know that. So I give myself to you as your slave. You make the decisions. This is your responsibility now. It was an extreme way to pray, I know, but it was an extreme situation. And it gave me great comfort at the time, and it really helped me to feel comfortable later when I was facing big decisions. Um, anyway, I didn't know what God's plan was for me, but I couldn't get it off my heart that I had a vocation to marriage. I knew that wasn't the case for all widows, that in theory I might have a vocation to single life or religious life, but I felt that I still had a vocation to marriage. If I was right, that meant that it was through marriage that I was supposed to continue to grow in personal holiness and try to gain heaven. But, you know, the middle-aged widows with 10 kids aren't exactly flying off the shelves, you guys. <laughs> it felt unlikely. Um, all I could find to say to God was, God, I am yours. I want what you want and only what you want. I have this desire to be married and I can't make this happen. So either you make it happen or take the desire away. And that was my pretty constant prayer for a year. Then some mutual friends who are in this tent right now introduced me to a handsome Catholic man named John with four almost all grown kids. They conspired to introduce us at a hastily thrown together Halloween party. Those of you who used to read my blog, right, remember that I threw my own fake Halloween party when I wanted to get to know Jim. So I don't know who needs to hear this, but it's October, you guys, fake Halloween party. Think about it. All right, so I met John and he absolutely was overwhelmed by the idea of a widow with 10 kids, the youngest of whom was four, and 
who not infrequently gets recognized by friendly strangers in public places, and he did not call me. <laughs> so let's just leave that sitting there for a moment. And we're going to back up a minute to my little throwaway mentioned before in the trustful surrender to divine providence part of three different kids barfing all over three different rooms. That happened in the middle of the night and required a lot of cleaning up, obviously, and the driving home of a couple of Michaela's kids who had been sleeping over because, yeah, they did not want to stay in Barf Town, USA. <laughs> but she's the one who gave me the book, remember? And I was, by this time, committed to the concept. Rosie even uh, mentioned to her how weirdly unfazed I seemed in the moment. I was just kind of rolling with it. And that's really how it felt to me, too. But I decided I'd better get up and go to the early Sunday Mass the next morning because who knew when the next wave of barfing might hit. So I was at Sunday Mass alone, which never happens. And John was there, even though he usually goes to the later Mass as well. I didn't see him, but he saw me. And God put it on his heart to ask Michaela's husband, Kevin, if he could get my number and see where things might go. So... Three months after the fake Halloween party, he asked me out. <laughs> we really enjoyed each other's company right from the get-go, but we both had some preconceived notions to get past. We both had questions to ask each other and to ask God. We started hanging out right as Lent was beginning, and my kids and I don't use screens for entertainment during Lent, so he'd come by and we'd all be sitting by the fire, playing cards or reading aloud. And we might have allowed him to think that that's what our house was usually like. <laughs> um, our first meetup was Saturday morning mass, just like we all went to this morning, and then coffee. Our second was Saturday morning mass, and then a hike. And a lot of hard questions and good answers. Our third was a visit to the LA Cathedral to venerate their tiny, tiny piece of the tilma of Our Lady of Guadalupe. Then our parish Lenten mission started, and he offered to pick me up each evening that week so that we could go together. And on one of the drives home, he mentioned that he had told his daughters that we were dating. And I was like, are we dating, or do we just go to church a lot? <laughs> and he took the hint, and he asked me out to dinner. But, of course, going to church a lot is the best possible way to start a relationship. He had faced hardship and heartbreak of a different kind. But both of us had thrown ourselves into prayer and the sacraments. Both of us had read Trustful Surrender to Divine Providence. I think I was kind of on my own on the voluntary slavery thing, but it's probably best if both parties don't enter into a relationship with the goal of res relinquishing responsibility. Um, both of us had discerned that we had a vocation to marriage, and it felt pretty quickly like God had had a hand in our friend's schemes to introduce us. We felt strongly that however complicated this all might seem in the short term, in the long term, it could only work for good for us and all the people that we love. John is a cool guy, and he drives a Jeep Wrangler, and it's stick shift and everything. <laughs> During COVID, uh, Jeep people started giving each other little attaboys in the form of what they called ducking other Jeeps. That meant leaving a rubber duck on or in a fellow Jeep driver's car. So John had received a duck, which he kept on his dashboard. And my kids saw it and thought that his little duck looked lonely. So they grabbed a duck from their bathtub duck collection and snuck it onto his dashboard. So now he had a John duck and a Kendra duck. For the record, the John duck is a duck duck. The Kendra duck is lavender, one-eyed, and has like cow horns. Uh, one evening, John came to pick me up for a date to a restaurant. We went out to the car, and there was the John Duck and the Kendra Duck sitting on the passenger seat, and they were surrounded by 14 little baby rubber ducks. And in the middle of it all, all of that duck chaos was an engagement ring. And it was pretty cute, and I said yes. And <laughs> we got married five months to the day after our first date, Mass. Um, and now, uh, instead of being an empty nester with like hobbies and whatnot, 
he's been doing math homework with little kids and heaving things into a giant dumpster and refilling swamp coolers for a bunch of ladies. <laughs> Uh, all because you just never know what's going to happen when you let God take over. So thank you for being here today.